anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died, so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage one another with these words. We brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please be seated. A very warm welcome to you to All Saints Church here in Dunstan for this service of celebration of the life of Sheila. In order to get through the service, you do need to have sight of the order of service so that you can join in um, with the service. This is not how we would want to celebrate Sheila's life. Let's be honest to start off with. Um, I suspect in normal times that this church would be absolutely heaving with people. Um, sadly, we are limited to 30 because of current guidelines. Um, and so there are 30 of us in here, but we do have the wonders of modern technology in the fact that this is also being live streamed for those who are at home. So welcome if you are at home watching us here. If you are coming up to speak at any time, then if you please come to the lectern, you can remove your mask at that time. Um, and the mics, one is for the PA system and one is for the live stream, so you can actually hear or everybody can hear what's actually going on. When it comes to the hymns, I'm afraid current legislation means you can't sing. So we have four ladies in our choir who are going to sing the hymns on our behalf. It does not say, though, in the regulations that you can't hum. So if you'd like to hum along to as loud as you possibly can, that'd be really grand. Um, or just sing really loudly in your head with all the descants and everything. And at the time of the hymns, you're more than welcome to stand or stay seated, whichever you feel most comfortable with. We start, though, with a moment quiet and a moment prayer. We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you all. We have come here today to remember before God our sister Sheila, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to God, our merciful Redeemer and Judge, to commit her body to be buried, and to comfort one another in our grief. God of all consolation, your Son, Jesus Christ, was moved to tears at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. Look with compassion on your children in their loss. Give to troubled hearts the light of hope and strengthen in us the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as children of a loving Heavenly Father, let us now in a moment quiet ask for his forgiveness, for he is gentle and full of compassion. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our Father forgive us our sins, and bring us to the eternal joy of his kingdom, where dust and ashes have no more dominion. 
We now have our first hymn here in church this afternoon, which is Tell Out My Soul. As I said, you're more than welcome to stand, remain seated, um, and hum as loudly as you wish. I ask you to remain standing now. Um, this was a reading supposed to be for me, but I actually thought it'd be rather nice if we all said it together, um, as you're not allowed to sing, so we can actually speak together. As we saw, say together, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, its darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Would you please be seated now as we have our two eulogies, firstly from John and then from Sandy. My mum, Sheila, was a remarkable person, and I am proud to be her son. Sheila Elizabeth Millican Bell was born in Genoa, Italy, on 28th of February 1931, to James and Lily Bell, and spent the first days of her life there. Following the outbreak of war, the family moved back to England in 1940 in one of the last scheduled boats to leave Europe. 
life back in England was very difficult. Sheila's father, whose wartime activities were focused on his knowledge and contacts within Italy, was away from home for long periods of time. Her mother had suffered an attack of influenza in 1939 and her health never recovered and she remained unwell over the following years until her death in 1948. Consequently, during the war years, Sheila and her brother John were obliged to stay with relatives, moving around the families in very difficult circumstances to Congleton, Liverpool, Wallasey and Surrey where they had plenty of experience of the flying bombs aimed at London. With this start to life, one might expect Sheila to have been a disturbed and difficult child and teenager, but in spite of all the problems of her childhood, she became one of the most caring persons one could ever meet. At age 10, she carefully and successfully nursed her six-week-old cousin through a bad attack of whooping cough. And perhaps it was this, ex this experience which sowed the seeds for what became her life's work. Despite a disrupted education, Sheila gained a school certificate at Wallasey Grammar School and qualified as a teacher at Gypsy Hill College, London. She taught in Hendon and Finchley for six years, experiencing large classes and teaching many children from deprived backgrounds. Several children in the school came from a nearby children's home and this started her interest in children without families. In 1956, at St James's Church in Edgware, Sheila met Philip, who recalls how he was immediately drawn to her friendly and welcoming personality. It was not too long before he was invited to tea with Sheila and her father. Romance followed, and they married in 1958. Sheila left her teaching career to devote herself to bringing up her family of four children, David, me, Pauline, and Sandy. And for many people, that would have been quite enough. But not for my mum. Her love of children called her to start fostering in 1968. And from that time onwards, 136, we think, more children followed. And Paul, Jonathan and Toby joined the family, bringing the number of us children to seven. As time went on, her interests and expertise in babies and children with learning difficulties and special needs grew exponentially. Alongside this, she always recognised the challenges faced by and sometimes the hidden potential within the parents of these children who themselves were often faced with great difficulties and Sheila did whatever she could to support them. In 1974, Sheila had a serious operation and remained in hospital for some time. It was so typical of her nature that as soon as she could leave her bed, she was up and busy doing her best to offer care and support to those around her in the ward. A fellow patient commented to Philip that once she was better, nobody would be able to keep up with her, an opinion Philip believes undoubtedly to be true. Sheila's nature was quiet and unassuming. She was quick to deflect recognition from others, thinking of herself as only doing what she ought to do. However, in the year 2000, recognition arrived, which could not be deflected. As she wrote, I shall always remember the day we went to Buckingham Palace and met the Queen, who presented me with the MBE for my fostering work. It was such an occasion, scary in part, but the Queen is so friendly and seems to know all about you and why you are there, having been briefed whilst you are approaching. My knees felt like jelly, and I was glad to sit down and watch the rest of the long line receive their honours. It was lovely to be reunited with Philip and Toby, and after some photographs were taken, I had another surprise, to find some of my family waiting outside the palace gates. A little boy was passing, 
by with his parents, and seeing me all decked out in my finery and hat, said in a loud whisper, to the embarrassment of his parents, Is she the queen? I shall always treasure that moment. As her own family grew and the fostering continued, Sheila began other ventures. She became a visiting lecturer at Chiltern Nursery College, helped to set up and run Reading Mencap Bubble Club, a weekly club for under fives with severe learning difficulties and their parents. More recently, and until lockdown, she volunteered weekly at both Rhyme Time in Cavisham Library and Time For You, the playgroup held at Cavisham Baptist Church. She was known and loved by many, many people. Always her family held a central importance to her. For more years than I remember, every Boxing Day, she and Philip hosted the annual family gathering, with around 30 of us getting together from all over the country for an afternoon of food, games and fun. Sheila loved to tell stories, often from her own childhood. I particularly remember the one that ended with her walking unknowingly over a floor covered in cockroaches. I remember too her sayings. If ifs and ands were pots and pans, there'd be no need for tinkers. A stitch in time saves nine. What can't be endured, sorry, what can't be cured must be endured. And my own personal favourite, many a mickle makes a muckle. There are, of course, so many memories of Sheila. She touched the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Whatever Sheila did, she did so with love, care, compassion and kindness. She inspired many, many people. We have received so many messages of condolence and support. Here are just a few. I shall never forget her gentle smile and the love and respect she had for so very many people. I spoke to Sheila only a few weeks ago and she was giving me some excellent advice on getting my baby grandson into a routine. Sheila truly was one of Britain's greatest generation, compassionate, loving, incredibly hardworking, wise and true. In the course of her life, she must have turned around the life chances of so many lost and abandoned babies and young children. Her skill as a teacher and expert knowledge of young children combined to make her a superlative volunteer and such fun too. Wherever she went, she spread joy and happiness in the lives of everyone she met. Sheila was an amazing lady and spread so much good in her life. She guided so many young lives towards a path of achievement and gave so many a sense of belonging. There are many more similar messages, but I'm going to finish with something that my daughter Amy wrote immediately following the news of Sheila's passing. Today my heart broke. My beloved grandmother passed away. Strong, independent grandma. Caring for everyone without question. The rock and foundation of our huge family. My inspiration. The stiff upper lip and keep calm, carry on attitude enabled her to do the work she did with strength and dignity. She cared deeply loved fiercely through her actions even more than her words. Many children, including myself, found refuge and safety in her house with its firm boundaries and routines. The family gatherings, rooms filled with toys and lined with smiley faces. Such love and belonging. I'm proud to be her granddaughter. I'm not as strong, but I know I have inherited her love and passion for loving the children the world has turned its back on. 
I hope I do her proud and continue her legacy. Grandma, I love you. You have left the world in a better place for having you in it. Thank you. I don't remember a time before fostering. I wasn't quite three when we started. But I know that fostering quickly became a part of family life. And as I grew up, it felt completely normal to welcome babies into our family and a while later to say goodbye to them as they moved on. Mum was a very natural foster carer, giving unconditional love to all. She instinctively knew what babies and small children needed and how to settle them especially when they first arrived. Because of this, she was, right from the beginning, an unintentional pioneer. She forged her own path by insisting on meeting adopters before they took their new baby home, which was somewhat revolutionary at the time. Welcoming parents into our home so they could see their children and writing daily notes about those in her care. Much to her consternation, some of these notes were actually used as evidence in court. Part of her was always sad when a child was leaving, but she always tried to remain positive. She was really pleased if families had sorted themselves out and children returned home, but also had satisfaction in helping to create new families through adoption. Much to her pleasure, many families kept in touch over the years, a testimony to the relationship she built with them. Mum never shied away from a challenge. When Toby was just a few years old, for a few weeks, she also looked after two other small children, all three of them under three. And somehow, she fitted them all into the pram to go shopping. I think she appeared in court three times as a witness. And although she was quaking on the inside, she can't have shown this, refusing to be browbeaten by barristers. She was determined to say what she thought was in the best interests of each child. She must have made an impact on at least one judge because he turned to her before she stepped down from the witness box and said he hoped she would achieve her ambition of fostering 100 children. In fact, she went on to foster many more. Shortly before retiring, Mum decided to set up a support group for carers who were fostering babies as she felt they had particular needs and challenges. She really enjoyed these meetings, and her thoughts and advice were welcomed by all. She was sad to re finally retire just over seven years ago at the age of 82, and after 45 years' service, but knew the time was right. She did, however, keep her interest in fostering and loved hearing updates. Every time we spoke on the phone, one of her first questions was always about whoever we were looking after. She's still respected and remembered by social workers, summed up in a message we re received from one of them in the past couple of weeks. Those of us who met her whilst she was still fostering with Philip have a vivid memory of her passion and commitment and nurturing nature. Should have also said that the hymns are actually chosen today by Sheila. So this one particularly is her favourite one, Jesus Bids Us Shine. And I must admit, I've not sung it in church for donkey's years. Um, so do stand or say, remain seated as the choir sing, uh, Jesus Bids Us Shine.
Would you please be seated as now um, Reverend Colin Baker from Sheila's Church, the Cavendish Baptist Church, comes forward to read the Gospel passage and also to offer some words of encouragement and hope. Thank you, Colin. The reading is from uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 25, uh, through to uh, verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and you gave and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you, a stranger, and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. With the brief time uh, and the privilege that I have to share with you a few words um, through this message, I want to, in doing so, to obviously to tribute Sheila, uh, her service to the Lord and also in, and that's been demonstrated through her care for others. I first met Sheila nearly three years ago and I was immediately struck by two facts. This was somebody who really cared about others. I mean, genuinely cared. Her husband, Philip, her family and the many children that they have both fostered and the many little children in our community who benefited from her love of nursery rhymes and teaching them to children and making sure the adults knew them as well. In private conversations, she would also take time to explain their origins and she could tell you a lot. Sheila's commitments at uh, the Time For You at Caversham Baptist Church was incredible. She was always grateful for the help she received uh, through our times of worship before lockdown and in many ways was even more so um, uh, thankful for what we have been able to do uh, through uh, YouTube and through Zoom regularly uh, through Philip's skill, I think, getting everybody uh, in front of the screen. Her energy, however in working with children was nothing short of miraculous and totally belied her age. Oh, for us all to have that same youthful spring in our step. And there's several songs where she literally sprang from the seat to a standing position faster than a two-year-old or or any teenager, certainly, because they move slower, uh, or any fit adult, Sheila could still do it. Sheila demonstrated that zest for life. My second fact is obvious and not to be missed, rooted into all that Sheila cared about was her love for God. When we care, as Sheila did, we are aware. We are aware of the need uh, of Christ and our constant dependence on him. We're aware of the needs of others. 
and we're aware of the timing of Christ's return. Sheila was always ready. In saying farewell to Sheila today, we're reminded that uh, none of us have forever and that one day every one of us will have to give an account of ourselves before him. I don't think Sheila has a long list of sin, but she has a lot to tell the Lord. But he already knows, of course. Accounted to Sheila are many wonderful acts of kindness, and you've all experienced those. I'm not going to rehearse them all. Her unconditional acceptance of others into her life was a gift and an incredible blessing. Her account has clearly been credited with many good works. But good works amount to nothing unless the motivation is right. Sheila's motivation was clearly demonstrated through her love for God. When we care as Sheila did, uh, we prepare. We count the cost. I'm sure she counted the cost every time she looked at another child that was going to be brought into the house and still did it. We may ask... Am I doing my best? Am I giving my all? We know Sheila did. We ask ourselves, am I doing what I can? Each must give in their own way the very best that they have. We know Sheila did. When we care as Sheila did, we will repair the hearts of humanity. As John so eloquently put it, that um, so many lives, courses, were transformed and uh, turned to a better course as a result of her care. Children, relationships, and church and families, God's church, his church, not ours. When we care as Sheila did, we share. We share by doing by telling and by giving and singing nursery rhymes. Sheila truly worked out how to love her neighbours as she did herself. Who were her neighbours? Well, you just have to look around you, pretty much anybody she met. She didn't really uh, have a list of people that she didn't want to be her neighbour. And when we care as Sheila did, we dare. We dare to step out in faith. We dare to risk. We dare to stand alone if necessary. Truly a groundbreaker in terms of the foster care that she did. When we care as Sheila did, we rely on prayer. I'm nearly finished. It was D.L. Moody who said that every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. I'm not sure how many times Sheila may have bowed in prayer over the issues of a young child that she was looking after. You can't do that, all that stuff, just by your skills. Our dependence upon God is of great importance. Isaiah 62, verse 6, says, You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. Let me say to everybody today, if you are struggling, and many of us are, bear in mind the circumstances we're in, Our reliance upon God, for me certainly, has been what's brought me through. Trust in him. Give yourselves no rest. It doesn't mean exhaust yourselves. It means give your time to God also. Because your problems will still be there. But God is interested in you. Nothing costs more than caring. Nothing costs more than caring except not caring. I wonder what the world would have been like if Mrs. Sheila Bocock, MBE, didn't care. There'd be a massive hole in society if she didn't care. What would our lives have been like if Sheila hadn't cared And what would our lives be like if the Lord didn't care about all of us? 
Sheila cared because Jesus cared and showed how. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. She's a Christ-like figure, isn't she? Totally. Our lives are God's gift to us. What we do with them is our gift to God. Sheila takes that with her. Somebody has rightly said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. That which I can do, I ought to do. And by the grace of God, I will do. We give thanks to the Lord today that Sheila had the determination to do what she could as well as she could for as long as she could. And today, Sheila, we're grateful you did. My response, our response, is one of gratitude to God for Sheila and a determination to model her godly life by God's grace. God bless you, Sheila. Thank you, Colin. We're now going to have a time for our own reflection as Roger, our organist, plays the music for reflection, O Holy Night. Quiet time of prayer now is going to be led to for us by the Reverend Patrick. Whether you're here in the church, outside, or joining us online, can you invite you just to be still in God's presence as we pray together? And at the end of these prayers, I'm going to invite you to join in the Lord's Prayer if you want to follow the words that are on the service sheet before you. So let us pray. Let us offer praise and thanks to God for the gift of life. And as we do so, to offer thanks to God for all we have received in and through Sheila, Mum, Grandma, Great Grandma. Let us be thankful for her family for the place she called home and all the places she enjoyed and for all those with whom she found friendship 
either very temporarily or on a deep and lasting basis. As we hold each member of her family and all her friends in our hearts and minds, may your love be offered freely to every person, that through that love, moments and tears of sadness will be transformed into ones of joy and thanksgiving. Inspired by her example, let us commit ourselves to the comfort and support of all those she loved as she is missed by them. Let us surround each other with open, compassionate and welcoming arms as we ask for your comforting presence with us. And help us, like her, to be beacons of generosity, of empathy and of hope. Lord, as we offer you thanks for her practical gifts, her integrity and honesty of speech, let us, above all, remember her love and care for others, no matter who and no matter where. And we pray that you will hold her in your presence, that place of joy, of loving care, of friendship and of peace. Lord, we praise you for all that we have in life, for all those we honour in death, and we pray that you will bring us all into the joy of your kingdom. And we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We now have our final hymn here in church this afternoon, Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
Would you please be seated? Let us now, in a moment's silence, commend Sheila to the mercy of God, our Maker and our Redeemer. God, our Creator and Redeemer, by your power Christ conquered death and entered into glory. Confident of his victory and claiming his promises, we entrust Sheila to your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died and is alive and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender towards those that fear him. For he knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like the flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone, and its place will know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures for ever and ever towards those that fear him and his righteousness upon their children's children. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes. The busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. At Philip's request, uh, the choir and I are now going to sing to you the blessing. Would you please now stand for the Alleluia Chorus as the coffin leaves church. Um, and if you're going out to church for the actual burial, then it's straight over from the main door into the new part of the cemetery. It is very slippy, so please do be careful. Would you please stand? <laughs> 